Good afternoon YouTube and welcome to my E46 M3 CSL replica build. In this video we'll be reviewing the last almost four years of ownership, talking about what it's cost, what the process is, what the best things I feel I've done to the car and the problems to look out for if you're in the market for one of these legendary E46 M3s. So firstly, I must apologize for the haircut. A little bit of a belly as well. It's been about three months now. We've been in lockdown with COVID. So there has just been no grooming, no gyms. I just look an absolute state at the moment. So bear with me during this video. But like I say, we'll talk about everything on the E46 M3 that I've done over the time. And I'll give you a background on where I ended up getting into an E46 M3 and where we are today. Back in my early 20s, I was at a Renault Sport meet. I was all about that lifestyle, hot hatches back when I was 21, 22. And we ended up going to a meet in Portsmouth, which was on Gunwharf Keys. And we was in the car park and all of a sudden I just heard this thunder coming from across the car park. And little did I know then when the owner pulled up and said, yep, it's my M3. I was like, what on earth have you done to that? He said, nothing, it's just a CSL. And he popped the bonnet. And from that point onwards, I was like, I need one of these in my life and obviously as you do you look online absolute fortune and then as years went by the m3 csl prices just went absolutely crazy so at that point i wanted one but unfortunately i'd never be able to justify owning one roll forward a couple of years and an ex-girlfriend's brother called me up and said i'm going to pick up an e46 m3 do you want to come with me we'll go and pick it up together it's like a couple of hours away and obviously at that point i didn't know a lot about them i mean i knew they were impressively fast especially compared to a two liter clio sport and obviously i knew the csl from that car park encounter so jumped in the car went down it was a silver gray and man we went out on the test ride and i was just absolutely blown away by it and we drove back and he had the smg it didn't have the csl software i wasn't aware of this at the time and I just wanted one so bad like i was in the car on the way back and i thought this compared to my clio is it's luxury it's fast it just feels so alive it screams through the revs and i knew one day one of these would end up in my collection now i've been known to be a bit jewish with things i don't necessarily like wasting money i like buying things that are safe investments and i watched the e46 sort of tumble down in price and they ended up getting to the point i think where you could pick a high mileage ropey one up for like five or six thousand pounds and crazy now when you look at what they're going for really is should have just bought a load of them and put them in a warehouse but essentially my good friend matt was like think you should buy one and i was like mm, i don't know it looks like headache i hear about these vanos problems and then i hear about the boot floors cracking i thought this could just be an absolute financial nightmare if i buy the wrong car so he said look i fancy having one for a little bit how about we find one we like i'll own it and potentially once i finished with it after a few months because he changes cars a lot if you watch the channel you buy it off me so i thought this is probably as near as damn it as the best test drive i'm ever going to get on any one i buy and sort of roll the dice so we ended up going to birmingham it wasn't a local car it never is and being an e46 most of them seem to be from birmingham unfortunately but the gentleman was nice enough we went out on the test drive and in that time since i'd last been out and one i'd had motorbikes i'd had or been out in quicker cars and it was a bit like yeah the smg's not what i remember it being this is a bit it's not as friendly as i expected it to be it just felt a bit clumsy and i thought you know what if he buys it obviously he's going to use it for a couple of months and sell it we'll go from there so because he'd driven up there it was myself that was driving it back so essentially i got to pre-test drive my car before it'd even be my ownership and we drove back from birmingham and i pulled around this 
like, I think it was like a toll station area bit, the M6 toll, and I was like, I've made a mistake here. Why did I suggest an SMG? This is horrible. I mean, for those that have driven a normal one without the CSL calibration on there, you change down gear, and it was very much like, think about it, think about it, bang, gear down. And it looked messy, it felt messy, and I found that if you just coasted on the throttle changing down, it'd be smooth. But that's not what you want when you're coming into a bend, slowing down, scrubbing the speed off, is still humming the throttle. So at that point, I drove back. I was really happy with the car. It was clean bodywork wise Interior was all clean. It didn't look like it had been abused. Running in service was all done. Full service history, mainly BMW at the beginning, and then specialist. So we drove it back, and Matt was like, what do you think? I was like, yeah, I mean, I love the look of it. It's okay. Like, wasn't blown away by it, but Matt ended up obviously using the car for a couple of months. So it finally come to that point where it was my turn to buy the car. So I thought, right, Matt was pretty good. He was like, you know what? I don't need all the cash straight away, just as and when you're ready. So thanks to Matt really for putting me in this position to be able to get it and obviously giving me a couple of months to get the cash together towards it. So Bought the car, got it home, went for a good Cotswold blast, the roads that I know so well on the motorbikes, and I really started to gel with the car, but again, I just couldn't get on with this gearbox, and I thought there must be a solution. Looking online, everyone was like, you must put the CSL software on there, which is an uprated version of the SMG software, and essentially, it just makes it much smoother to drive. It rev matches coming down the box. It shifts faster when you're flat out. It's a win-win situation, but I will cover that later in the video. So at that point, Matt had then ended up going with a manual E46 M3, heavily modified things. And for those that have followed the channel from the beginning, it'll be one of the first videos where I actually introduce this car and Matt's modified E46 M3. And his was fantastic. It really was. It had so much money spent on it, but it was pretty rough to ride with because it had the AST coilovers, it had the stack intake system. It just was not friendly at all. If you're going flat out, brilliant, but otherwise it was just a bit of a chore to be in. And he did really enjoy that car, but I don't think it was the one for him because a couple of months after that, he ended up selling the car. Not because there was anything wrong with it, it just wasn't for him. And as I say, if you've watched the videos, most of the content in the car front is his because he just changes motors so quickly. So that ended up getting sold on. I finally got the CSL software done and actually really started to gel with the car. And that is probably where the nightmare began of just going absolutely crazy with the modifications. So before I get underway of going through all the details on the car, I'm gonna put a link in the description to the project thread, which is the start to finish on the M3 forum of how this car's come back. So I do get a lot of questions on it, and I'm always happy to try and help you guys out, but obviously I can get question after question after question in the comments, and it's all the information I think is in that project thread. So I'll link that up now, and obviously if you haven't done so already, check out the Instagram page. It's obviously where all the content for the car comes from first. If I've been out on road trips or anything like that, I always make sure it's uploaded loaded to the gram so make sure you give us a like and a subscribe on the channel and obviously a follow on instagram so before i give you a full rundown on the 10 things i would do and the 10 things to look out for the best advice i can give you whether it's manual or smg is buy the best one you can honestly this is the sort of car you do not want to scrimp on and take my advice on that because if you end up buying a cheap one and you think you've got a deal and it needs maybe the Vanos rebuilding, the SMG pump changing, brake discs and pads all round and tires, add two, two or three grand to the price straight away. If you've got a head gasket gone, as we covered in an earlier video on the channel, that's a 1500 plus pound day out if you have a blown head gasket. So always do your research. These cars are very expensive when they go wrong, although they have come down in price from obviously what they were new. I've got a purchase invoice for this with all the options. It was like 50 something thousand pounds like back in 2003. But they are obviously a lot cheaper than that and things do go wrong. They are a solid car, I think overall, but there are a lot of problems associated with the engine that can occur. Head gasket, van arse, so again, we'll go into that further in this video. But if you're in the market for one, spend as maximum amount i mean you've obviously got other options like the cs which is a highly spec one than the normal m3 and then you've got the csl the cs having a quicker rack slightly better braking um, it's got the m dynamic traction mode as standard but for me unless you're doing it and it is an investment the normal e46 m3 will be more than enough 
So I'll run through the 10 things that I've learned with the E46 M3 to watch out for or be wary of if you are in the market for one. The boot floor. Now, this is something I was actually aware of when I bought mine. I'd already factored in that it needed to be done. And essentially, unfortunately, more so it seems to be with the SMG cars, but it does happen with the manuals as well, is the actual boot floor itself tears away from the rear subframe that holds all the diff in place. Now, if you catch it early with just a few cracks, it's a pretty simple fix, but if you leave it to the point where it tears the boot floor, you can actually just kill the car doing it. I've seen some stuff from Reddish Motorsport where these videos they got online and it is just tearing the boot of the car out, how it gets through MOTs. When you do look for, to purchase one, you hear a lot of people saying it's had the BMW fix or it's been checked by BMW. Unless you drop the rear subframe, you can't guarantee it. So if someone says, yep, I've had it visually checked by my local garage, he said it's absolutely fine. I would, would say act very cautiously. The BMW solution was to simply fill it with resin and apparently there's some sort of plate they put in there. Again, it's not a permanent fix. So if you are gonna go through the process of buying one, you want one done by the specialists. From what I've seen online, Reddish Motorsport seem to be the best guys for the job. They've done so many of these and their attention to detail is fantastic. I'm not being sponsored by them, but if I was to go back to the beginning again, that's who I'd have do mine. ETO Motorsport did mine. They're a well-recognized BMW specialist as well, but also I've seen some of the repair jobs that Reddish have done and it looks absolutely fantastic. But again, if you need to have it done, add £1,500 to the bill. As all the boot floor is all obviously attached to the rear subframe, everything has got to be dropped. Prop shaft, drive shaft, diffs, the whole lot has to come down and then they weld in reinforcement plates. So it's a big job. It's not something I would do on the driveway because I can't weld. But like I say, if you're handy with the spanners and you can weld and you've got a ramp, I can't see why you wouldn't be able to do it. It's pretty straightforward. But I'll put some pictures in now of what happens to the boot floors and you can see the hairline cracks. When ETA did mine, thankfully, they said, it's just got a few small cracks, a couple of spot welds have moved. It's not going to be a problem. This is going to be an easy fix. So thankfully, that all got done when it was in for the big service. Number two, in terms of big problems, like I say, I've seen over the years of owning the car with the E46 is the Vanos and the head gasket. Now, essentially, the S54 engine is a masterpiece. It really is a beautiful engine. And if you do get the chance to drive one, I haven't found anyone yet that said it's a bad block. And it is a fantastic piece of engineering, but it also has some serious issues when they go wrong with the head gaskets and the Vanos. Now, the Vanos system controls the cam timing. It's quite a complicated bit of kit. If it fails, it's not a two minute procedure to have it changed over. Again, these are not people I've used, but Mr. Vanos is on Facebook. He seems to be the man that, if you've got any issues with the head gasket or the Vanos, he's the person to go and see. And essentially, it is serviceable. They start becoming noisy. You'll end up losing power if the Vanos fails. So so it's worth making sure that it has been done or find someone that can actually run the diagnostics check and make sure that the Vanos is okay. And the next biggest issue, which is the head gasket. Now I covered this in the video you guys saw at the beginning of the year, just before this COVID came in. And it's something that I'd put off because I had none of the symptoms and I thought I just going to act really, really upset if this has gone because it's going to be a 1500, maybe two and a half grand day out if I decide to do the Vanos at the same time as it's all apart. But essentially the head gasket splits between the liners, which means it won't pick up under a normal head gasket failure, i.e. the filler cap being oily, but you will lose power. You will get detonation when you put your foot down under wide open throttle. It's quite a simple check if you're out on a test drive. Like I say, if you're in the market for buying one, put it in a high gear, four, four, fifth, two and a half thousand RPM, sink your foot on the accelerator, and it should just, you're obviously not just gonna fly away at that sort of RPM gear, but it should just be smooth. If you feel it bucking, it's an indication that the head gasket's on the way out. So again, factor in 1500 plus to get that resolved. SMG pump, well, the SMG for its age, I think has done well. I mean, a lot of people slate it, really slate it. And I would side with people in terms that it's not a great daily box. It's a terrible box without the CSL software. But when pressing on, it's absolutely fantastic. It always puts a smile on my face, especially when the timing's right for the use. And you've got the adjustable modes on it as well. Generally, when I'm driving flat out, I'll always have it on the highest setting. 
round town set in three or four is enough to still be smooth now the problem with the smg is it has an smg hydraulic pump that can fail it's like the region of two thousand pounds from bmw but there is an aftermarket one available from germany for about five six hundred pounds which is supposed to be uprated so that means that once you fit that you shouldn't have any issues with the pump but they have issues with the detent springs they have a problem with the salmon relay that they call it thankfully not something i've experienced touch wood but Obviously, compared to a manual, it can be a little bit more involved or expensive if it does go wrong. But if you can buy one with an uprated pump, like I say, it's a roll of the dice. It's an old car, but it wouldn't put me off buying one. I'd certainly have an SMG again if I started from the beginning. I don't mind a BMW manual. I find them quite notchy, not particularly engaging to drive with. If you've ever driven something like a Honda S2000, if they'd done a manual like that, I would have owned a manual simple as that but bmw manuals just don't do anything for me personally and like i say i'm more than happy to have the smg but if you are buying one obviously just be aware that it can be expensive and it can also sort of strand you wherever you are because i've been across europe i've been obviously to north coast 500 and if it had failed it's you know a manual is pretty straightforward whereas the smg you start losing your gears you're going to end up going home on a recovery truck which is far from ideal especially if you're five six seven hundred miles away in europe bottom end shells or connecting rod shells as some call them not a big problem on the e46 especially in comparison to the e92 which just seems to eat them for breakfast but the e46 does suffer with wear on those and they can fail generally if you've got a car that hasn't had the running in service done which the service book should state at 1200 miles or one that's gone long oil interval services or been abused from cold are all signs of concerns but i've seen people on the owners club of these do 120 130,000 miles on the standard bottom end with absolutely no issue but then like all things if someone's abused the car or neglected it you could have them wear out in 60 70 thousand miles but they're not like i say as sensitive as the e92 but just something to keep in mind that if it does fail s54 engines used i mean a decent one two and a half three grand so the last thing you want is buy one couple of weeks later it throw the bottom end it's going to be a bitter start to that relationship of m3 ownership the brake pressure sensor. Now, this is one of those issues that you can drive around, so it's not a big one to worry about. The part's about 100 pounds. It's a bit of a fiddly job mucking around trying to do it, but essentially it monitors the brake pressure in the ABS unit. When it fails, flags all the ABS up, you lose your ABS, you lose a lot of your traction control settings. So not ideal in the wet, but you can drive around it. And like I said, it's not a big part to fix. I mean, there are two of them. Unfortunately, without diagnostic equipment, it can be difficult to confirm which one it is. But like I say, not a big job, not a big problem. Change mine now, put two genuine BMW ones in it. There are pattern ones on eBay for about 15, 20 pounds, but for the aggravation of pulling it back out again, just go BMW wheel speed sensors again another sensor issue now this one's a bit more of a nightmare so i went out for a drive with matt to goodwood he had his amg mercedes at the time had a brilliant run brought the cars back washed them left his house pulled out went to hit second gear i was like i'm sorry it's not changing up have i left it in auto nope it's in manual and then the whole dashboard lit up i lost the smg pump went all funny it was missing gears the speedo was still working for mine but it just was not happy so essentially you got sensor on each wheel the one at the rear controls the speedo the two at the front again work with the abs and everything like that and the car was just having none of it i managed to limp it home but it was missing gears it, it made it feel absolutely awful and to get a bosch sensor thankfully was only 40 pounds so if you do get an abs wheel speed sensor fault it's not a big deal it's a bit worrying at first like i say every light comes up it drives like a pig it honestly felt like something was really busted in there but put the new sensor in reset it and again touch wood it's been absolutely fine since i replaced that sensor i've done a video on that as well on the channel again it's not a big job a normal diy mechanic at home can do it um, and like i said the best thing also i can advise is getting yourself a good obd bmw reader for these i mean it's it's made a world of difference for all the ones i have for the e46 and the e92 it makes life so much simpler just to be able to see what the problem is without just throwing parts at it brake fade well this is one that caught me quite early on i'd heard about it but i wasn't expecting it to be an issue on the road so when i bought the car it had standard brake discs and pads all around 
Again, round the Cotswold, spirited drive, nothing crazy, single track, national speed limits, but within 20 minutes, I started getting the old soft pedal and I thought, oh, just take it easy, let it get a bit of air through there. Started pressing on again, and then by the time I'd come back from that drive under hard braking, the old wobbly steering wheel, so I had managed to warp the discs, and again, this was road driving, so the standard stuff, I think you'd be mad to put on track out the factory but the good news is there are solutions so you can uprate the pads i've also gone with the eight pot k sport kit on the front with the padded rs29 pads completely stock in the rear and i've had it up around the cotswolds i've had it across the alps in europe when it was like 30 35 degrees i had it around the nurberg ring at 25 30 degrees and absolutely no issues with fade or brake wobble so it's not a cheap day out but like i say 12 1300 pounds if you actually plan to drive the car as a weekend car rather than just a commuter i'd certainly recommend upgrading the braking system <laughs> exhaust flange kit now the e46 m3 runs a full stainless system as standard i've even had mine in the air 90,000 miles other than a little bit of surface rust here and there still looks a complete system the problem is between the link pipe and the bat box is it uses mild steel flanges and i'll put a picture in here of mine and basically it's common fault they crumble apart and then obviously you start getting a leak at the back box. Now, thankfully for me, mine didn't leak. It just, when I did the rear brake discs and pads, I was like, oh my God, look at the state of that. And again, I'll drop a picture of it. And they do an uprated stainless steel kit, which I've got on there now. I think it was about £35. So not a lot of money. But as you're starting to probably gather from this, things can get very expensive if you haven't had them done or checked out beforehand. So when I had all the boot floor done, they dropped all the exhaust and everything. I was like, Do you know what, guys? just get this fitted just get it all sorted and then i haven't got to worry about it the rear view mirror well this is one you probably wouldn't even think of i certainly didn't but i'll set the scene for you so me and my missus getting ready to go away on holiday and ju just the day before i leave i'm like Do you know what? i'm just going to park the car right up in front of the garage keep all the bikes safe and I got in and I sort of looked at the mirror and I thought, why does it look like half a glass of water's in there? And I'm like looking up at the top thinking, could something have leaked through? Has it got water in it? And I thought, never mind. I'm going on holiday, 10 days away, not even going to entertain looking at this. Sitting by the pool, drinking my pina colada. Post pops up on Facebook. Hi guys, just seen that my rear view mirror looks like it's got water in it or it's leaking. And then I read the comments. So what happens is inside the mirror it's got a dimming fluid which is controlled electronically when it gets really hot out like the time when we had the weather at 35 degrees the glass pops and what that means is all this fluid drips all over the dash and all over this part here all the center console and the problem is it's like brake fluid and it has reacted all this paint down here and the problem was i was then sat round a pool I think it was in Fort Aventura at the time, had the keys with me, so obviously I couldn't tell someone to go in there and clean it up, and I just had to wait till 10, 11 days were over to see what damage had been done. So not end of the world for me, because I'm gonna get this repainted, but the replacement mirror is 99 pounds from Mirror John, and it's designed never to leak again. If you buy a standard one again, you're gonna be a couple hundred pounds. So he's got full guide on doing it, been really impressed with that, because like I say, it hasn't given me any issues now. It dims better than the original anyway, and hopefully when I get this all repainted at some point, I won't have this problem again. Number 10, Rust, the big one for E46 as it stands currently. I actually got hit with Rust pretty badly on my E46 320D, so I was fully aware of it when I bought this. And what looks like just a bit of bubbling on the outside, it runs so deep. It makes such a mess. Now, if you're lucky, you just get it in the front wings. You can replace the wings. Unfortunately, they're only available from BMW and they're something like six, 700 pounds a side. If it's in the rear, you could be looking at a really expensive day out to get that sorted. I mean, 
rust is never good it just seems to get everywhere and the more you cut back the more you find so as soon as i bought this from matt jacked it up took all the arch liners out treated everything with acf 50 which is like a rust prevention spray that's really popular in the motorcycle world and absolutely thrilled to see that there was absolutely no rust in the wings in the arches so big big weight off my mind there because i thought if i strip it down and everything's rusted to bits again it could be one of those things where it just costs spiral out control if you go and view one of these and somebody says there's just a bit of bubbling on the arch i'll show you a picture of what my 320d looked like so i took it in for mot i was like yeah that rust is definitely getting worse and then when it went to mot we took the side skirt off and the whole jacking point was just absolutely destroyed and again this is not on my m3 but same chassis so i know this could be as prone to it so i definitely recommend if you do buy one that's clean either do what i do now i mean i haven't in four years of ownership used this in the winter it's been a dry weather summer toy only but if you do use it every day just make sure that you get them arches protected because it could make such a mess otherwise so now on to the exciting bit the 10 best modifications now obviously this is my opinion people will view it differently but for fast road weekend blasting this is what i would say are the best things you can do The first and probably if you could only do one modification to an E46 M3 SMG is the CSL software. I cannot stress how much better it makes the car. And I had mine done from a chap on the forum. It cost me £100. And as soon as I drove away, 100% improvement everywhere. Like I say, it blipped going down the box rather than just sort of throwing a gear in. It was smoother going up, but faster. It was better around town. It's... It for me is the best modification and thankfully one of the cheapest. So if you haven't had it done, that's my first choice modification for the E46 M3 SMG. Number two, the CSL Airbox. Now this is not a cheap day out. Anywhere from 1500 used for a kit to two and a half three thousand pounds if you want to throw some custom mapping in there as well it is a hell of a lot of money and it's not a lot more power some people say it gives nothing some say 15 horsepower for me the sound alone is oh man just absolutely incredible everywhere from 2000 right the way up to the red line it sounds just like thunder when you're opening that throttle and if you put the windows down when you're driving with it it's even louder it is an absolute monster and the feeling it gives you when you drive it especially when you're flat out through the box or even when you're rev matching down as the smg blips through oh man it sounds so good so for me that is number two i've done plenty of videos on it on the channel you guys have heard it when I went around North Coast 500, when I went in the Euro trip, it just sounds absolutely brilliant. It's how they should have come as standard. You've already got the throttle bodies there out of the box, so it is just an airbox, but man, what a noise. And the beauty of the aftermarket CSL, the replica airboxes like I've got here, is it doesn't have the sound flap in it. So there were some people that were saying it was there to aid low airflow and improve low end power. They've proved it on the dyno that it's only there for emissions to shut it up. So you get the carbon snorkel the carbon airbox and again i'll run a clip over of it it just it's absolutely brilliant fun it always puts a smile on my face just ugh, i would definitely put that on another e46 m3 if i started again <laughs> So number three is the big brake kit for me. As I said, I went with a K-Sport. You can go Brembo, you can go Alcon, you can go AP. It gets very expensive very quickly. Now, the kits that are available, you can have a fixed disc, a floating disc. You can have a mild pad, an aggressive pad. But I run the K-Sport 
fixed disc kit with the Paget RS2 9 pads and they are very dusty. They're only squealing once they get really hot, but other than that, I've absolutely loved them on the road. They've made such a difference. The pedal feel is razor sharp and you can just lean on those brakes so much. To so say we went round the ring, it was a hot day when we came into Germany and I had absolutely no issues with braking power going around that circuit. And for me, again, it's something that if I bought one, I wouldn't hesitate to do again. The braking system is a real weak link on the E46 M3 as standard, and it does make a big difference upgrading it. Number four, Michelin Super Sport tires. When I bought the car, it had Dunlops on the rear and it had some Hankooks on the front and it felt okay. I knew I was gonna have to change it at some point. And when I put the big brake kit on, I went out to do the bedding in procedure. I won't confirm the speeds, but it does require a high speed to bed these in. And I was just thinking, nah, this, these tires are just not capable of doing this anymore. These Hankooks, whoever had fitted them before, were just not fit for purpose now for what I wanted. And um, when my good friend Matt got married, he had the Porsche Cayman Black Edition, again, one we reviewed on the channel. And I followed him on a somewhat spirited drive to his wedding. And he was entering these roundabouts and the car was just understeer, oversteer, which if you're in an open space is great, but if you're trying to make ground, not what you want. So I ended up putting a full set of Super Sport tires on the car, which, have really transformed it. Since then though, the Michelin 4S has come out, which I've got on the E92 M3. And if you're using the car daily or in the wet, I think personally it's the better all round tire. It still has a good level of grip. It is absolutely incredible in the damp or the wet. Whereas the Super Sport, once it gets wet, it's not quite the same. So it does make a big difference having a good set of tires on there. And like I say, for me, I'd do it again. I mean, ultimately, set of cup twos would be fantastic for this i have been looking but is it going to be a widow maker if i get caught in the rain i've seen people use them in the wet and they seem to be okay but if i go out to the alps again in it i need it to still be sort of versatile that it can be used in wet or cold conditions number five recaro cs seats these bad boys so the standard seats are okay. They're not a bad seat. They're not massively supportive, but they give a good compromise for a daily car. And I found the seat was a bit too high, not enough upper body support when really pressing on. The Recaro CS are a fantastic seat. They're a lot of money, like a really lot of money. Each seat without the adaption kit to fit it all, you're looking at a thousand, thirteen hundred pounds. So you can easily go to two and a half, three thousand pounds fit in a set of these to the car. Now, for me, the seating position is absolutely spot on. My eyesight is in the top of the steering wheel. The support is fantastic. I can still recline them if I wanted to put someone in the back, not that I ever do. And because these are actually from a Lotus Evora, a first generation, they're all in the black leather. So it ties in with the rest of the interior rather than that Alcantara suede finish. And thankfully, because it's the early version, it just says Recaro. The later ones, unfortunately, do say Lotus on them. So it looks a bit out of place in the BMW. But for what these cost me used, absolutely thrilled to bits with them again it's something that's all coming together to make this such a fantastic car number six eye back spring so this was something i did quite early on in my ownership of the e46 because the front just sat a little bit too high every time i washed it i stood back i thought need to lower it a little bit it bugs me i like a car that's settled not slammed but well suited in height and offset so bought the eye back springs i think it was about 180 pounds for the fourth obviously two for the front two for the rear and didn't like i say really change the ride in terms of comfort or performance or handling it still felt very oem to me but it did drop the ride height so if you're looking just to change the height i would say the eye backs are worth going for from what I've looked online, the H&R seem to be a better spring for improving sort of the stiffness of the car, but ultimately an OEM plus, just an improvement on the ride height, I would choose the Ibex. Number seven, steering rack. So the E46 M3 as standard doesn't feel particularly sharp. It's nicely weighted, but it feels potentially a little bit 
Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It just feels a bit excessive in the movement to get any response from it. But the weight's beautiful. But there is a cheap solution. So a standard D46 M3 has what they call a green tag rack from BMW. There's a purple tag version, which is what I fitted here. You can pick them up for 50 to 100 pounds. They come in some of the non-M cars, such as my 320D had one. And for the cost of it, combined with a solid steering coupler, which gets rid of the rubber donut, it's made a massive difference. It just feels a lot sharper. I did find that I had a sort of a bit of bit of play or it just felt a bit dead spotted at 12 o'clock and it completely got rid of that for me which was a nice improvement if your budget allows go for the blue tag rack the problem is this is what's found in the z4m and the csl so they do fetch big money and again it's an even shorter ratio rack but it's probably the best of the best you can get if your budget allows but the purple tag is a good compromise for the cost Number eight, the Turner Motorsport Anti-T Roll Bar Kit. Now, this was something that I've been on the fence about doing for a while. Because of the eye backs, I still felt the car had quite a lot of body roll in it. I wasn't ready at the time to go coilovers, and a lot of people have said that it makes a big difference upgrading the anti-roll bar. So I did the front and rear kit from Mira John, who provided the, the Turner Motorsport Kit. And to be honest with you, it was bigger improvement than the eye back springs as soon as i went out after fitting them i could just feel how much more level the car was and it's fully adjustable as well so you can really tailor how you want the balance and the turning to be but for me that was a big improvement and they are adjustable like i say so you can play with them the question will be is how well they work with an aftermarket coilover kit is it going to be too much with the standards been enough so we'll certainly find out because that is one of my modifications later in the day but as it stands for the cost, I think it was about £450 for the anti-roll bar kit, did make a nice improvement in just making everything feel that much firmer. Number nine, the 4.1 ratio diff. So the standard E46 M3 or any M car for that matter or BMW always feels very long geared to me. It doesn't feel sharp. It doesn't feel like the ratios are close. There is a solution, and now the reason it's called the 4.1 ratio wheel is it's the crown ratio in the diff. Now, essentially, in an E46 M3, the standard ratio is 3.62. Now, that's good for well over 180 mile an hour if the car has the power to do it. You're probably never going to max it out here in the UK. I certainly don't find, even on our tracks, that I get anywhere near using it, but if you reduce the ratio down, you can then improve acceleration, the feel of the car, and that's what the 4.1 ratio diff does for the E46 M3. And now again, I've covered it on a video, I'll put links up at the end, but it's not a cheap day out. From what I've been looking into, I was very fortunate that my good friend Matt had a spare one from a Z4M, so it had an uprated differential over the normal E46 in it as well. But he did me a great deal on that, and I do owe him for that. But the normal diff kit can be anywhere from sort of 800 to £1,000 pounds plus fitting. And it does make a big difference. Like I would normally find that anything after sort of third, fourth, it just felt a bit long hanging them gears out. Whereas now, fourth, fifth, sixth, it just feels so quick going through the box. And I've been really happy with it. So if I was to do it again, yes, I'd buy another one. I'd probably install a more aggressive diff as standard than a BMW one. But I'm thankful that I've got an uprated one over, obviously, the standard E46 version. Number 10, the Powerflex Black Series bushes. So when the car went in to ETA Motorsport to have all the rear subframe plated up, they said, look, we've got it apart. The bushes are looking very tired. You can either fit genuine BMWs or another popular solution is Powerflex's Black Series. So I've had the rear done with that. I kept the standard diff mounts because I didn't want the drivetrain noise coming through the car but I have gone with uprated subframe bushes and trailing arm bushes. And when we eventually, I keep saying eventually, do the coilovers and do the uh, front geo side of things all over again, I'm going to put the black series lollipop bushes in there and obviously all new wishbones, track rod, track rod ends, etc. But for the cost of those, again, as you again experience from this video, the cost can start adding up very quickly, but it does 
really finish the package off especially now as these are old cars 17 years my one is so 90,000 miles worth of wear so the big one the cost now i've been very lucky that obviously i've bought used parts so it's made it a lot cheaper i've also sold a lot of the standard parts because i never returned in it to standard again and i've also been lucky that with youtube people have discounted prices on items for me to promote on the channel so I've saved a note of the sort of retail figures of what the items on the car would cost you. CM wheels, so obviously the replica CSL wheels, mine came with them thankfully, but to buy these, six to seven hundred pounds. Super sport tires for the set, eight hundred pounds. 12 mil wheel spacers and new bolts all round, 150 pounds. Ibac springs, 180 pounds. CSL software, 100 pounds. The big brake kit, 1,300. The mirror, £99. I did rear discs and pads, standard, that was 300 quid. My bill from ETA Motorsport, that was £2,000. Two brake pressure sensors, £200. CSL diffuser, 250 GSR airbox, so the Jeff's still racing, ECU and everything, £2,000. Had an alternator fail, £200. CSL bumper, £500. CSL boot lid, £700. Anti-roll bar kit, £450. Recaro CS seats, again if you go new, two and a half, three thousand pounds 3000 4.1 ratio diff, plus fitting, £1,000. And a lot of these items are plus fitting, are plus paint. And I tallied that up to be over £15,000. £15,000. And there's not any real big maintenance in there. It's not like... I've had to rebuild the van also, I've had a head gasket go, the boot floor sure was one of them, but that is a lot of money to get it to this stage and I've been pretty good in keeping track of what it owes me and I don't regret it. Do you know what I mean? I could go and buy a brand new F80 M3 competition, what, 60, 70 grand, two years later, be worth 35, 40. So horses for courses and what you want to do. The journey hasn't finished with the E46 M3, that's the problem. There's still a lot more to go, but it's certainly a bit of an eye-opener if you are gonna buy one of these and you do wanna modify it. So hopefully you've enjoyed the video. Obviously, if you did, make sure you give us a like and a subscribe. It does help me grow the channel. Ultimately, I'm sure there's many of you sitting there thinking, why didn't he just buy a CSL? Well, truth be told, you can't for that money. CSL is now a 40, 50 grand and you've still got the boot floor issue. You've still got the brake issue because you can still cook the standard brakes. It's one of the most popular upgrades for the CSL that people do. You've also got the 4.1 ratio diff. So there are a lot of factors in there. And at the time, I couldn't afford a CSL. It's been easier for me to do it over this process. But now I could sell this. I could probably sell the E92, buy myself a nice cheap daily and have a genuine CSL. But truth be told, unless someone said to me it'd be a straight swap for this, I can't justify the value in it. Sure, it'd be lovely to have it for the status, the collective side of it. But I don't think I'd use it. I'd be too afraid to put the mileage on it. I wouldn't want anything to happen to it. So for me, I don't regret building this from scratch. It's been one hell of a journey and I've taken it on some fabulous road trips, going across Europe, taking it to the Nürburgring, the North Coast 500, and I've got plenty more trips planned in it. So I'm happy with how it stands now. I mean, the big things that we're gonna be changing over the next, I'm probably gonna say next year now, because this year with COVID is just a write off. but. We've got a lot in the pipeline for what's going to happen. Ultimately, if I can bring myself to throw the money into it, which I think I'm so financially committed already, I'm keeping the car forever. That's my stance and that's how I plan to be with it. But I want to get rid of the Jeff Steel airbox. I'd like to go with the Cabonus one because their quality on that kit looks absolutely fantastic. The Jeff Steel one's been good but it's not got a great air filter housing in it. I'm not politically sold on it. The bracketry I don't like as much, whereas the Carbonus one looks like a completely factory item, like an OEM Plus. They also do a full carbon skin roof. That means I would have to get rid of the sunroof, which I'm not fussed about because I hardly ever use it anyway. That would then bring it more into removing weight from the top. It would definitely look more like a CSL. The next thing as well I would like to do is 
changed the front bumper. Now it has got an SSDD front bumper on there, which hopefully from the intro to the video you guys can see, it's, it's good enough quality. It really does, like I so say, generally when I'm walking around the car, I think, yep, for the 500 quid with that cost, you can't really complain, especially as it included the splitters. Now the problem is, it's starting to lose shape. It doesn't have the bracing like the original E46 M3 bumper does, or the genuine CSL. Now the good news is, a friend of mine on the interweb, Mike, he uh, sent me a link to Mile End Composites, which look like they do a really pucker copy of the CSL one. It looks really good. So eventually, I think I'm gonna to have to dig deep and put one of them on there. And if I do go new front bumper, I'll blow in the wings and the bonnet because I got some pretty nasty stone chips on there from some morning blasts that me and Matt have had. We went out one morning, I was following his ZM and it was one of those nights where it rained, it dried in the morning but it moved all the shite to the middle of the road and we got to uh, Caffeine and Machine and I walked around it and I was like, what a shame because up until that point it looked really fresh still. So it's going to need to be repainted, they haven't gone down through to the metal, it's just down through to primer. So not a big job to resolve but like i say once the bumper gets done might as well do the wings bumper bonnet get it all blown in on the front so plenty of stuff to look forward to also need to refurbish the wheels the rear back one has unfortunately started getting a bit of lack of peel on it front left one i had a little whoopsie on unfortunately done a bit of damage to it so need to get those repaired the argument would be that you could just buy a new set for almost the money of repairing them but the problem i've seen from cm wheels is the finish isn't a hundred percent out the factory so i'd rather just get these repaired take them to my guy stan who just does an absolute fantastic job with real refurbs and make them look brand new again so that pretty much concludes the video guys i say i hope you enjoyed it if you did make sure you give us a like and a subscribe unfortunately i'm not somewhere quiet today because the car is in storage you can hear a lot of road noise out the front i do apologize hopefully the microphone has prevented a lot of that but we've certainly got plenty more to come on the e46 obviously this year is going to be a little bit slower i've got another alps trip planned and i think because of the bits i need to do or want to do to the e46 I may brave it in the V8 this year. I dread to think how much fuel I'm going to use going across the Alps. But it should be a fantastic experience. And obviously, I will blog it all for you guys to watch. So until next time, thanks for watching.